All right, and welcome back to our introduction to machine learning for material science. So far, we've been through a few sections and we'll be diving into section three, which is on feature engineering. Um, so if I scroll down to the outline, um, so first we looked at, you know, what is the data set we have available to us? Uh, we did some cleaning on that data set. We tried to make it the most useful um, and the, the kind of best data set that we can make it for machine learning. Uh, we talked through a few uh, ways that we can analyze it to know what's in there and how that might influence our decisions later on. Uh, section two was on feature generation. We took the chemical formulas that we had access to and we changed them into a format which can be directly uh, used as input for the machine learning. Um, and now we're going to be looking at feature engineering, which is how can we actually change those features and make them more useful to us. Um, we'll talk through a few different strategies uh, for how we can do that. So if you're following along, you can click again on the hyperlink and we'll jump right down to the feature engineering section. Um, as a reminder, as we're executing the cells and going through here, um, I'm just using shift enter to execute everything that we go. So I can just select this cell um, and hit shift enter and that'll kind of get us rolling here. Um, so I'll skip over um, the text here. If you're following along, you want to read in more detail, you can uh, read some of the text kind of background, but it'll be going through a lot of the same stuff I'm talking through here. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to remove all the constant columns. Um, so if you noticed previously, um, I don't know if I called attention to it uh, or not, I don't think so. When we looked at the features here in our data frame, what we might notice is that some of these um, are the same. So look at this column here, um, right here that I'm going to highlight. So this is BCC mag mom composition average. This is um, a magnetic property of the materials. Um, and all of these are zero, as far as I can tell. So let's scroll down here and look briefly. Um, we're skipping some of the section again. We have a bunch of rows here, so we're not going to output all of it. But for all the rows that we're looking at here, all of these are zero. Um, so this is basically a, a useless feature, as far as we can tell. And if we gave this to the model, um, it would basically give us no new information. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do for our feature engineering step is we're going to remove all of these columns. So we generated a huge range of them. Um, basically, you know, automatically. And now we're going to go back and try to remove the ones that we don't think are useful. So the first ones we don't think are useful, again, are the constant ones. So we can just do this um, simple filtering step here where we say, you know, if something isn't changing at all, let's just take it out. Um, and each time we're going to um, output um, the length of our um, column set here. So now we're, it looks like we have 86 features. Um, whereas previously, I'm going to scroll back up and check. If we look at the size here, we had 87. So it looks like we only had one um, constant column there, and it was that one that we found. So we can remove that, uh, make sure we're not you know, giving it any stuff that isn't useful there, um, and then we can move on to the next. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do um, is remove something called correlated features. So I just executed a bunch of cells here just so I could have the output to talk through, and I think I'll go through and do that all the way to the end of the section just so we can... Um, look at the outputs together instead of running through and having them all pop up one by one. So I'm going to run through everything down to section four and I'll scroll back up and we'll talk through the outputs. So uh, the next thing we're doing is we are removing highly correlated features. So um, when we talk about correlation between features, we're talking about features that are giving the same information to the model. Um, so previously we said we identified, you know, features that don't give any information to the model. And now we're going to say, what if we have two features, but they're telling the model the exact same information? That would be another way that we'd have kind of a useless or feature that's probably just giving noise to the model and not really giving anything um, interesting. So one way we can visualize the correlation um, and see it a little more directly um, is by making something called a correlation matrix, which is shown here. Um, so what we're showing is the numbers of the features um, on each axis. Um, and then we're showing how well correlated they all are um, with each other as um, intensities here. So um, what you can see is there's this diagonal line and this is showing that you know, everything is perfectly correlated with itself. That means you know, everything is exactly the same as itself. So the higher the color, the, the closer they are to each other. So what we see is that there's some here that are very dark blue. Um, there's this kind of pocket in the, in the top right here around 70, between 70 and 80. Um, so there's definitely features here that are, that are very highly correlated with each other, which means they're just not giving any additional information. And then there's other ones that are you know, very close to white which is not correlated with each other at all, which means they have totally separate information, which means hopefully they're giving, again, different information to the model and allowing it to learn things from all of that different information. Um, so what the cell blocks do here um, is they basically calculate this huge uh, correlation matrix. And then what we're going to do is we're going to filter everything that's 
um, above uh, 0 0.95. Um, you can see this here um, correlated with each other. You can filter above that and we'll say those are you know, too highly correlated. Um, this is somewhat of a, a subjective cutoff here. So it's not um, set in stone that that's like the right cutoff that we should make. That's a choice that we can make as we go along. So if you're uh, play, uh, following along at home, you could definitely change this and see how it affects your results. So this is one way you can sort of change things. Um, just know that you know the lower you set this value, the less features you're going to have going forward, but maybe the better features you're going to have. So that's one, again, decision you can make. Um, and it'd be interesting to see you know, what results you get if you're changing those. Um, for now, I'll just leave it as it is. Um, and we can potentially come back later and start looking at it more. So once we make that filtering step, um, we can replot and look again. And what we see is that previously, again, we had, I think, 86 features, if I remember right. Um, and now with the plot on the right, this is after we've done the filtering step. Now we're down to 71 features, and we can see that reflected in the numbers um, here. So um, overall, when we look at the plot now, we still see the diagonal line because everything's correlated with itself. Uh, but now everything is cut off below 0 0.95. So there's none of those super, super dark values um, that we had previously. Although you can still see there's some that are you know, fairly up there. So if we lowered down, we would definitely keep filtering some of these. Um, so that's the second step that we're going through for doing our filtering step. And the last, or our feature engineering step, I should say. And the last thing that we're going to do is something called normalizing the features. So what you might have noticed previously, and I think what we're showing here in this output, is that all of the features are very, um, not only different in the information that they're giving from each other, they're also just different in the kind of scope of values themselves. So if I call attention to these two columns in particular, the atomic volume and the atomic radii, what we can see is that atomic radii are generally on the scale of one or so. It's 1 1.1, 0 0.9, 1.2. Um, they probably, you know, they can get up to a little larger, a little smaller than that. But on this, if you uh, looked at the range of features, they definitely don't go above, you know, 10 or 20 or something like that. Um, whereas the atomic volume here um, is in the thousands. It's, you know, 9,000 here, 9,000. This one's 30. So this has a huge range on it. Um, going from single digits up to 12,000 in this case. Um, <clears throat> and what this means is that if we give both of these features to the model, um, this is especially uh, important depending on the model type that we're using. But it, again, this is just a general good practice. Um, if we're giving these to the model, what can happen is that the features that are just larger than the other ones or have more variation in them, um, can end up dominating the model. So even if atomic radii was really important, the fact that it only ranges from potentially you know, 0 0.9 to 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.5, um, means that it might uh, get kind of swamped out by something that's varying from 30 up to you know, 9,000, something like that. So what we're gonna do is a process called normalization where we just take the range of the features and we shrink them down so they're all on the same scale with each other. Um, and what we can see when we do that here um, in cell number 40 is that now we have all of these scaled um, so that they range between the same values. In this case, I think we chose um, a process here called min-max scalar, um, which sets the range from zero to one. So everything now has a minimum of zero and a maximum of one. And what this means is that now they're on the same scale with each other, but all the information there should still be intact. We haven't done anything to scramble up the information. We've just kind of compressed the range that it can be expressed in. So now if we uh, feed these all into a machine learning model, hopefully one of them won't get weighted above the other just because its values are larger than the other. Um, so again, this is a very common practice. There's a few different ways to do this. This min-max scalar uh, is just one way we can do that. Um, and that gets us through the feature engineering steps. So those three fairly basic things we can do, they're definitely much more complex um, and specific things we can do depending on um, more targeted uh, applications or depending on the specific project um, that you know, we might be working with. Um, but this is the idea of feature engineering as a whole. Um, so next time we'll dive in for section four, which is on model evaluation. We'll start to talk through you know, how do we actually assess a model um, and then we'll hopefully start you know, getting to look at some of our results. So hopefully I'll join you next time.